Okay, so um, this is sort of an attempt to, um, to introduce an open, open discourse on how to sort of try to look for new, for new models. Uh, the problem, of course, with economics is that um, uh, it employs a factor which is called mathematical modeling, which is why this book was important for me, because David Orrell is primarily a mathematician who does one of the most complicated mathematical models, which is the chaos models of weather forecasting. It's ironically the most complicated mathematical models today are employed in, in weather forecast. Um, and of course, the fact is that, the, that with 50% li likelihood, the weather tomorrow will be the same as today. That's your sh safest shot, and 50% of the time you will be right. And meteorologists are trying to do the best they can to move this up to 80%. Now, what has always surprised me is why don't we see the probabilities when you watch the, m the news and you, they say tomorrow it will be raining, why don't they say uh, with what probability? So, you know, sometimes it's quite clear, 99% tomorrow it will be raining. Other days the model is very uh, sort of uh, uh, fuzzy. So we're not sure, but most, well, let's say 16%, it will be, it will be raining. The problem is the following. I just had um, a, a debate in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in Zurich two weeks ago um, with uh, uh, an economist who does exactly these models for, for large companies. And uh, he told me an interesting story. He said that his bosses came to him and said, we want to know uh, the uh, situation of uh, the Swiss economy in 30 years. To which he, of course, said, this is, this is nonsense. This cannot be done. It is absolutely impossible. I will not do it. It's just, I mean, I, no way I can do this in anything that will even remotely pretend to look like science. But anyway, the bosses um, insisted so he said, okay, the only thing that I can do is I can uh, come up with uh, scenario models. So he developed uh, 38 scenario models. In one, you know, the oil will run out, in the other there will be wars, it said in Europe will fall apart. I mean, these are chances that we cannot even ascribe probabilities to. It's simply an event which we cannot say it's a 16% probability that the war in Europe will start. It, you can't assign, this is the difference. This was the, the main sort of input that Keynes had in the study of economics, the difference between uncertainty and probability. Uncertainty you simply cannot ascribe a probability to. It's an event that is non-repetitive, and it's an event that we don't, if, if, you, if you're throwing a dice, you can either throw it many times and from that derive that the probability of number six or number five falling is one sixth, or you can just study the shape of the cube and you can see that just by looking at the cube, you can see, okay, I can see that the probability of the one side falling is in one sixth. So you either have to have a line of occurrences in order to be, in that case, you don't really have to understand the event. Or, uh, for example, sunrise and sunset. Yeah, there was a line of occurrences every morning the sun rose. So, of course, our forefathers did not really need to understand how come this planet, is it evolving around the sun or is the earth or is, is the sun? We didn't need to know, simply we had a line of experimental or empirical observations and that was enough. So you can predict the future even without an understanding the phenomenon, but you have to have a line of, uh, of, of, uh, of observations. This is of course something that came under very heavy criticism and observably so by, um, by many. Most known of them would be, would be um, uh, the black swan from Nassim Taleb. Just because an event happened many times in the past uh, often increases the probability of this would not happen again, which is the famous example of the, um, of the Christmas, uh, no, from the, th of the Thanksgiving. Um, uh, what do they eat in America for Thanksgiving? Turkey. Yeah, so Turkey is getting fed every day. Uh, thinking that tomorrow, of course, it will be uh, even better and more food. Of, of, only the next day was Thanksgiving, 
and, and that was the end of, uh, of, of the feeding. There was no way that the turkey could have expected this. The other way is if you understand the logic of the phenomenon, and in that case, you don't need to have the, the line of, if you look at the cube, everybody will be able to say, okay, the probability of number five falling is one sixth without having to even throw the dice. So anyway, uh, so this guy, to come back to the story, he came to the board and he said, okay, so I have 36 scenarios. You pick one or you tell me which one you want to go. And you know, the answer was, uh, give us the most likely one. So the next day he said, okay, you know, this is the most likely one, but it is very unlikely that it will happen. <laughs> he said, well, what do you mean? He said, well, the probability of this one happening is 1.8 which is little more than every other because there the probability is below 1%. But as you can see, the probability 1.8 also means that it's very unlikely with 98% that it will not happen. But it still is the most probable outcome. And this really puts the ridiculousness uh, of the whole exercise to, to, the, to the upfront. Uh, now, let me, let me kind of... Um, let me kind of uh, go back into why we even think this is possible. Because if you look in theology, this is very useful in theology. We have had more than 2,000 years of very complicated debates whether God or the highest intelligence who knows the velocity and position and intent and the aim of every single quantum or quark in the known galaxy, whether such a being could predict the future. This is a theological debate. It has been a very difficult debate, and towards now, it most likely looks like that even God cannot see the future. Quoting Alfred North Whitehead, um, the, the future is radically open even for God. Why? Because there is a basic element of human freedom. In other words, these two things cannot coexist. Either human beings are free, now we are discovering that even uh, photons are, in a way, free to decide whether they keep their uh, quantum state or whether they actually collapse the wavelength into, into a particle. But that's, that's a difficult, different, um, different topic. So the future is absolutely unknown, most likely even to God. The only exception is economists. <laughs> Sociologists will not so readily talk about the future. I mean, would you ask a sociologist when will, I don't know, discrimination of females end in Honolulu? And they would say, of course, yes, this is, let me see, Honolulu, I see, okay. Uh, 16th of May, 2026, plus minus three days. Um, even when you talk to lawyers, they cannot be certain how, you know, each uh, legal case ends up. But economists know with a precision to the one hundredth of percent how much GDP we will produce next year, not to talk about inflation, unemployment, and etc. Where did we adopt this? Well, David Orwell wrote a, a beautiful book, which I recommend to you, and it's called Econo Myths. And there he talks about myths that we economists believe in. Uh, my contribution is I will try to sort of maybe describe how these myths are made. And what's more important to me from a philosophical point of view is not that we deal with myths. That would be a better uh, option. Uh, I think the situation is far worse. We don't treat those myths as myths. We treat them as facts. Many philosophers ironically agree that we live today in a post-ideological time. Nothing could be more fundamentally misleading than this statement. We today live in the most fundamental of times. Why? Because we believe we live in a post-ideological time. In other words, in the past, people were actually aware of what they actually believed. A stupid example, every Sunday you would go to church and you would actually repeat yourself to yourself, I believe in Father God, you know, you know, so, okay. These are sort of things that I believe in. You were aware that that's a belief. Today, we consider these beliefs or, or different beliefs to be facts. And that is, of course, the home run of every ideology 
is to not even be questioned as an ideology. And this is how, um, how, how this happens. Today we are uh, ashamed of our beliefs. And of course, for example, I don't know, um, uh, how do we deal with beliefs in, in science? To take the most difficult of all examples. Well, my thesis is that what we do is we shift the beliefs into the context, making the very hard, for example, a model, look extremely hard. So we push away the soft, and we keep the hard, and the hard pretends to be extremely scientific, numeric. Two ways how to, how to look at it. A funny way how to approach this is the uh, story from Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. You know that in this book by Douglas Adams, uh, the human beings were sick and tired of philosophers debating about the meaning of life, universe, and everything. So they constructed, how many people have read the book actually? So, okay. So they construct this machine called Deep Thought, and this machine is huge, it's a computer, and it is made to calculate, to give us the answer to the meaning of life, universe, and everything. So this computer says, okay, I understand the question. Give me, I don't know, two million years to calculate the answer. It's a very difficult question to calculate. So the machine goes into a sort of a deep sleep, and, and there it, it, it calculates it. In the meantime, of course, philosophers and others go on strike because they fear that once this question is resolved, they will lose their job. And, and, and exactly. Uh, after a couple of million years, this machine wakes up and says, okay, now I have it. I have the answer to the ultimate question of the meaning of life, universe, and everything. So the whole multiverse gathers, and they, they, in a great celebration and great expectations, they finally look for the true objective scientific mathematical three times QED, um, uh, QED answer to the meaning of life, universe, and everything. And the computer says, the answer is 42. Okay. Yeah, what do you say to that? Why is this funny? Because this is, I think, in a way, how we want the truth to look like. We want it to be exact. We want it to be mathematical. We want it to be objective. We want it to be not influenced by beliefs. Um, uh, and done by some models that we don't really understand. This is our sort of idea of, of, of the truth. What's the price to pay for this? The price to pay for this is that the answer doesn't actually make any sense because it misses the context. Let's zoom in economics. Um, or this is how actually, is, um, another example, this is how, um, this is how, um, Paul Samuelson does it. How many of you are economists? Don't be ashamed, I'm an economist <laughs> myself. Okay, so you know, Paul Samuelson, for the rest of you, is sort of the Bible of economics. Um, for 50 years, uh, this is how economics was taught. This is the basic trick of Samuelson. He, for example, wants to show that human beings, um, uh, well, whatever, doesn't matter. This is the method. He, he wants to show something, and he gives a mathematical, meticulously detailed proof in which he sort of shows very, even I would say, trivial, simple issues, but he shows it mathematically. For five pages, he goes on, then he pauses, and then he says, and because we assume that human beings are free and rational human beings, we can continue, and he continues with mathematics, and on the 17th page, okay, QED, you just, I just proved to you that this is mathematically correct. What's the problem there? Well, wait a minute. You just spent 12 pages showing a small little detail of mathematical logic, which is sort of quite easy to see even without the proof. And in one sentence, you dealt away with the huge topic of whether human beings are or are not really free agents. This is a topic of thousands of philosophical books. Whether human beings are rational or not is something that we have been debating since the time of Plato. And you can't really spend 12 
pages on meticulous mathematical details and then swallow with one sentence a whole problematics with, uh, uh, of, uh, of, of human freedom. But because it's embedded in mathematics, it looks that it has been proven beyond doubt, beyond any normative statements, because that's an absolutely normative statement. Let's get back to the example with 42. What's the problem there? Well, the problem there is that the price you pay, the, the number 42 doesn't make any sense. Why? Because the context is missing. Where is the soft? Where is the normative in economics? Well, it's hidden in the word is. So when we say human beings, human being is rational, that's a normative statement. Because, hello, you know, you can't just assume it away. And it gets even worse. Uh, let's take an example how uh, physicists deal with their myths, okay? So when a physicist wants to calculate the freedom, uh, sorry, the free fall of, a, of an object, he assumes no friction of air. This is, of course, a stupid assumption. Everybody knows that, you know, thank God there is friction of air, otherwise we would immediately explode. But it's a sort of an as-if game, let's pretend, let's in a way also a little bit lie in this specific case, because, why? Because of calculation. Please realize also that all these assumptions are done for one and one reason only, and that's to make calculations more simple. If we didn't need to, ha to calculate it, we wouldn't have to make all these sort of assumptions. It's a special purpose vehicle for calculation. Otherwise, all these assumptions are, are, are not necessary. Um, so anyway, so he makes an assumption of which he knows that it's stupid, that it's unrealistic, and that it's sort of a trick to trickster the nature, um, and uh, he's aware of it. An economist makes a similar case. I want to calculate how human beings uh, consume, for example, or share their time between leisure and work. So I assume, like the physicist, that human beings are rational. So far, so good. The problem is when these two later on go into the pub in the evening and the economist says to his philosopher, you know what we discovered today? That human beings are rational. This is fine as long as you know that your myths are myths. The problem happens somewhere between the laboratory and the pub where this guy believed his own myths that he himself or she herself created for calculation purposes only. It would be like the physicist entering into a pub saying, hey, you know what we discovered today? There is no friction of air. Um, and to demonstrate it even more fully, there is a huge difference between saying, let's assume human beings are rational and saying human beings are rational. To demonstrate it, there is a huge difference between saying, let's assume I have one billion dollars and saying, I have one billion dollars. There you can feel it immediately. You know, with the first case, I can come to a pub and say, oh, I, let's assume I have one billion dollars. And you could say, oh, in that case, you know, we could buy an island. And I say, yeah, and in that case, I could buy a nice little pool made of Coca-Cola. Oh, and we could maybe give a little bit of money to the poor. And how about building a castle out of, I don't know, chocolate? Oh, while we're at there, why don't we have a huge... And you could dream forever until the waiter comes and says, okay, get out. Um, it's time to go home and then of course the dream collapses and we say that's the sort of a dreaming that we do in economics we start with a small little assumption human beings are rational or any other and um, then we sort of dream 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 but the waiter doesn't come to slap us but we continue in this in this dreaming also realize that we scientists we work in um, in a dreamlike setting this whole uh, method of uh, scientific discovery started with René Descartes with his book called Meditations on the Principles of First... Um, yeah, the, the principles, the medita Meditation on the Principles of First ph Philosophy. He's still called science philosophy, first point. Second point, 
let's take this word seriously. Maybe meditations really were meditations because if you really go into it, he is trying to get away from his um, emotions. He's trying to liberate his body from his um, uh, from the um, yeah from the from the senses. This is sort of what you do in, in a meditation. And then he dreams. His first method of scientific discovery is um, he dreams. How do I know that the real is real? Because in a dream, I also see a tree. I can, in a dream, I hear a tree. Um, maybe you also had a dream in which you had a brother or sister, which in reality you never have. But the dream gives you an impression that you always had. A sister. I, do, I don't have a sister, for example, but I have, have a few dreams in which I was dreaming I have a sister, and the dream also gives you the memory of having a sister. And you can come to the tree and you dream that you can, you can touch it, and etc., etc., etc. So the method that we still use in science is dreamlike. When you construct your model, you're really closing your eyes and you're sort of working in a little bit different world than what you see around you, in fact. It's, it's, it's a castle constructed in a dream world, which I'm not saying is not useful. In physics case, it's very useful. But we have to know that there is friction of air, because if you want to, ca well, I, when you want to calculate, for example, how a leaf of uh, paper falls, there you cannot assume friction of air away. But the physicist, is not making philosophical claims like the economists. Realize that the assumption of rational, rationality is a technical assumption. And then it, in the evening, it becomes a philosophical or even a theological, if you want, um, statement. Um, Solus, who was a pre-Socratic philosopher, once said a beautiful sentence. He said, myth is something that never happened, but it's happening always. So in this way, you know, it doesn't really matter whether Adam and Eve really had an ID 001 and 002. And um, what's important is that the story is reacted and relived by those who believe it on an everyday basis. Now, have you ever met Homo economicus? Have you ever met a perfectly rational human being? No, but then again, everybody is. There is, in fact, nothing you can do to cease to be a homo economicus. This is, of course, for those of you who do methodology of science, this is the first sign of, of a tautology. Uh, it cannot be disproved. This is an example. Uh, well, I start with a simpler example, how we economists work with tautologies. For example, this is not my idea, I wish it was mine, but this, I, this idea I borrow from, from um, um, Joachim um, um, Baumann, an MIT, uh, PhD from MIT, not MIT from PhD. Um, and he has this beautiful example uh, in which he talks about the, 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 the truths of economics. So one of the big truths of economics is that human beings react upon incentives. Yeah, this is something that is a very sort of meticulously discovered thing that we now preach. The only problem is if you look into an any, any dictionary and you look at the definition of the word incentive, you will find out that the definition of the word incentive is to what people react. So the sentence people react to incentives basically means that people react to what people react to. Which is true, yeah but um, doesn't really help us because it's, it's a tautology. The same thing happens with, uh, with the maximization theorem. People always maximize their utility. Well, if you take the word maximize and utility, those are strange words, and you look into the dictionary, basically what you are saying, the sentence is saying nothing more and nothing less than people do always exactly what they do. And they never do what they don't do. This is the meaning of the uh, very clever sounding, people always maximize their utility. What's the problem? What if I include, well, we can get to it in a debate if it's not, if it's not. Um. 
So, so how do we do it? Again, we push the normative, the philosophical, the religious, the beliefs into assumptions, making them appear harmless. But in a way, without these assumptions that are extremely soft, the, 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 the inside would not make any sense. A stupid example, if I say of a, of a woman, she's like a flower. Uh, what do I mean? Well, scientifically, this sentence makes no sense. Because female and flower, nothing in common. One does not produce photosynthesis, and the other one doesn't talk, <laughs> to start with. So scientifically speaking, she equals or is like flower is nonsense. Absolute nonsense. Yet when I say it, we all understand what it means. Why? Not because of the sentence itself, but because of the context. In our culture, it happens to mean that not she's not green and, and all other things that she is not, but that she is beautiful, tender. We don't even mean that she smells nice which is maybe the last thing that a flower and a woman could have in common. So what's the truth of the sentence, she is like a flower? Not in the sentence, but exactly outside of the sentence. In fact, if I wanted to scientifically compliment a woman, I would have to say, oh, today, darling, you are 98% beautiful. Your lips are 16%, but you really make it up with your hips because your hips are 99.9. .9. I've only seen 0.1% of girls that have better hips than you. This is how a scientist should actually speak the truth. But of course, this, you know, I tried. It doesn't really compliment anyone. So the, the truth of economics is not in the model itself, although it looks like it, but it's in the surrounding. So our answers are very similar to the 42 answers. <coughs> So, let me conclude, because I promised I will not speak for long. Uh, this is how we smuggle individual, normative, religious beliefs into economics, making them look like science. And that's the problem, exactly. So, when Friedman's, uh, or well, Paul, Paul Samuelson writes in the introduction of his book, and this you can find in any economic textbook, what's the point of this book? Well, to think like an economist. Okay, which one? Keynes, Schumpeter, Marx, Weber, or was Marx not an economist? Or how would you, or, or are you perhaps saying, Mr. Samuelson, that you want us to think like you do? Because that's the honest, I want you to, to think like I do. More honest would be to believe like an economist. Because we economists, for, unlike anybody else, believe in human rationality. If you don't believe in human rationality, it is very hard for you to do all these exercises. Have you ever noticed that there is not once anywhere defined the word utility in any economic textbook? Those of you who do economics for three, five years, we differentiate it, we are calculating utility without really knowing what it is. It's a very strange word, and that's why we use it. If we would put happiness, it would immediately sound ridiculous. If we would put goodness, it would immediately sound ridiculous as well. Utility sort of is a strange word, and that's why, it, that's why it works. So when Milton Friedman said, economics should be a positive science, what sort of a statement is that? Is that a positive statement? It's a normative statement, because he says economics should be a positive science, in which he, by the way, discloses a couple of things. First of all, economics is not a positive science, because if it were, you wouldn't need these sentences, because physicists don't go around saying physics should be a positive science, <laughs> because it is. Whereas in economics, we have quarrels about, you know, it should be. There you admit that it isn't. And, um, uh, and also by saying that economics should be value-free, well, value-free is also a huge value, by the way. It's a huge value for economics. So um, this is where the whole religious sort of uh, normative 
thing gets smuggled in. And I have nothing against normative, I have nothing against religious. What I do have against is trying to pretend that this is the holy truth, which is really, in fact, what we do um, in economics. Okay, I have exhausted my uh, 34 minutes, and now I think I said enough of controversial things to um, steer a debate. But of course, I don't know, when was this book published? Yes? Last week. Last week. So you had a lot of time to <laughs> read it. Of course. But any, um, so anyway, so the, the floor is yours. Thank you.